Hello and good evening, good evening, Falche, Trononawa, Cade Mila Falche, Gokdina Galeer, hello and good evening, welcome everybody, 100,000 welcomes to Chalk Waraku, to the Murphy household. For live Irish Mits, I am Anthony Murphy, this is episode, Shaska is a hooked, episode 68, uh, and we've been doing this every day since the beginning of the COVID-19 restrictions. Thankfully, a corner has been turned in this battle. Today marked a significant relaxation of the restrictions. So, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed, hopefully, hopefully. Uh, and hopefully everybody will continue to do their social distancing and behave. We started all this on the evening of the 12th of March, Thursday, 12th of March, when the Irish government announced its first uh, restrictions, the closing of schools and colleges, etc., etc., And what a roller coaster ride it has been since then. Uh, we've seen the lowest number of cases and deaths today since uh, March. We're very uh, deeply sorry for all those who have been lost. And uh, we hope uh, earnestly that uh, a treatment and or a vaccine uh, is brought about for this thing sooner rather than later. In the meantime, tonight we are going to look at the second part of Togal Brunya da Derga, otherwise known as, in English, the destruction of Darderga's hostel and specifically uh, Whitley Stokes's translation thereof. It might pleasure you to know that uh, Daisy Peters is the very first of the helloers tonight. He says hello Arriving early at 7.24 p.m. on YouTube uh, from, of course, Rio, uh, Rio de Janeiro, isn't it, in Brazil. Uh, looking forward to the second part. Brilliant stuff. Falcha, Daisy. Austin Davies says hello, all Geoglitch. Austin. Uh, River says hello, everyone. Hi, River. Irish technical thinker, and that's Marcus and Rachel. Drinking a little mead by the fire and ready to get carried away with the magical stories of old. Truly love these stories from normal folk like you and me. Brilliant stuff. Great pleasure to have you both along. Um, Erica Bow says, good afternoon. Hello, Erica. Follow you. Mandy McCurl says, hello, everyone. Kiamar Atoshiv, how are you? From the Isle of Mull in Scotland. We're great. Mandy, so far, so good. We had more rain today and lots of cloud. Tasha, Anna, Skamalok, and you. Jackie Stevenson says, hello, Anthony. And the Mythflix too. I caught up on yesterday's episode and ready for part two. Yay, brilliant stuff. Merit Braun says, good evening. Trinonawa, Merit. If that's how your name is pronounced, it might be Meray. Pat Rowan is the first of the watchers on Facebook. Fawjit, Makharja, Farik, Aaron Durrett is watching. Hello, Aaron. Barbara Barney says, hi, Anthony. Gia Glitch, Lloyd, Stilwell, Gia Reeve, Anthony, August Tua, August Tussa Fane. Lloyd, welcome along. Aaron Durrett. Hello, dear Anthony and Tua. Vashon in the house. Fashion is fashionable. <laughs> never mind. Rowan Grove, I'm sure you've never heard a joke about Vashon Island being fashionable before. Hello from sunny Colorado, says Rowan Grove. Margaret Ring is in the house. Falcher, Margaret Connors, a taught too. Alex Casterton says, evening, Anthony and Tua. Helen Guinan is in the house. Your Majesty. I still have to oil the wheels on that chair. Vicky Wallace Southern says, hello, my lovely friends. Good evening, Vicky. Sorry, I'm making rather noisy adjustments because the wheels are. I have to get a new chair, basically. But good evening to you. And also, hello to Evan, if he's watching. Long T Menno C. Greetings, Anthony, and fellow Tua members from the land of horned helmets. Yes, and I hope that uh, you were suitably enthralled by last night's episode compared to the uh, the yawn-inducing uh, uh, astronom astronomical calculations of two episodes ago. Margaret Kiernan, Kiernan even says hello and good evening. So I don't know what, Margaret. Henry Scullion says, hi, Anthony. Hello, Henry. Falcha. Kathy May Deo says, good evening, Mr. Anthony. The day to a from part, partly cloudy Newcastle, Washington State, USA. Well, we're partly cloudy, but to be honest, it's mostly cloudy. So there you are. Kristen Gray, Tiger, Geo Anthony, to a Northern California is cloudy, windy, and rainy today. Time for a fire, a drink, and a story. Doesn't California not get tremendously sunny, baking hot weather this time of year? Obviously not. Heather Garon Rice is in the house. Falls you, Heather. 
Melanie Lynn is watching. Hello, Melanie. How are you? Sheila Hawkins says hello from California to Anthony and all. I hope you are also suitably ensconced by the fire there, Sheila. Melo Nello, whose name is Neil, says hi, Anthony and the Tua. Fault you, Neil. If so, Aaron is saying to Helen, you're Helenness. <laughs> you're Royal Helenness. Helen, Helen, Helenness. Give them hell. Never mind. I was introduced to Duolingo by my granddaughter a few months ago, and it's a great help, says Ralph. Yeah, I've been at it, but I'll be honest, I, I kind of the past week I've been neglecting it because I've been trying to write my book. Nora Gaffney O'Connor says, Ichawako Lair, Ichawato Safay, Nora, welcome along. Jack Durkin says, Hi everyone. Lockdown ended for you, Jack. Yeah, a noticeable increase in traffic on the roads today. Mike Naylor says, hello, Anthony and Tribe. So happy to be among so many bright and interesting people, Mike and Jeanette in Princeton. We are so glad to have you both as part of our tour. Enjoying revisiting Maria Gimbutas. Yes, indeed. And I am uh, I was enthralled by that uh, documentary on uh, YouTube today. I really, really enjoyed it. And it was a reminder of, of how much of a forward thinker she was. She was way ahead of her time. And of course, she had to break through that class that glass ceiling uh, because uh, there was a tremendous amount of pushback against her, uh, especially from her male colleagues. Uh, and, and still today she gets boxed in and just, and uh, labeled, you know, as a feminist. Uh, so many of her ideas uh, going back to the seventies and the eighties are all still very relevant at this time. Is it that time already? Hello everyone. Anthony and all the lovely to us is Margaret ring. It is indeed Margaret. John McGovern is watching. I'm uh, doing a little bit of writing about Millmount at the moment, John. Fascinating. But uh, more about the folklore and a little, little, bit, little bit perhaps less about the history. Pulling up my chair by the fire, says Vicky. Brilliant stuff. Sharon Boggan Stitch says, Gre Greetings, Anthony and Tua. Thunderstorms and torrential rain here in Redding, California today. Eek. Okay, well, so long as that's over there, thousands of miles away, we'll be all right. Oh, sorry for you, Sharon. Owen Roy Badziak says, hello, Anthony and Tua. Turn on a what? John Roach, G Gadzooks, Sir Anthony. Thou didst quaff mightily last night, and yea, verily, may likewise quaff tonight. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Yeah, as I say, Stokes, I mean, he was a genius in his day, but in his day they spoke funnily. Greetings from Virginia, says Mariana Dunn. And of course, that's Virginia in the USA, not Virginia in Cavan. Anthony was brilliant in the unscripted interview with James Perry yesterday evening. I learned even more about Anthony and his work. Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't mention that on here. I was going straight from live myths to uh, a live interview with James Perry. And I was kind of a little bit, uh, you know, a betwixt in between. Anyway, there you are. Nick, uh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Nick Eska Casterton. Hello, Anthony. Been a lovely day here in Albion. Hi, Tua. I hope you're all very well. Fault you, Nick. Slaunch you. Melanie Lynn. Hello, Anthony. And the Tua caught up on episode one earlier and happy to be here tonight. Episode one's a funny one, isn't it? It's like, you know, it's just like sitting in front of a camera, not knowing how things are going to go and hardly any interaction. And look how it's developed. It's been brilliant. Pamela Walters says, Jerry from the Netherlands. Hello, Pamela. Yvette Tillema says, hi, Anthony and Tua. Thank you for the wonderful Sharon Blackie post today on the community page. Yeah, I saw someone else sharing that, and I read through it, and I was, uh, I haven't read her book yet. Uh, and one would say it's not a book for a man to read, but of course, it's very important for us to read these things. If women rose rooted, I have heard a great number of very nice reviews about that book. Megan Walter says, afternoon, all fighting the black flies to enjoy a cool, breezy day in the outdoors. Nice one. Megan. Katrina says, it might pleasure you to know, ha, ni chlushim shin gominic, shan, shan fosh, shan foshinta. Okay, you're not chlushim, listening, shin gominic, often. Shan Foshinta. I don't know what sh I, the Foshinta is. Anyway, you'll have to translate that for me, Katrina. Teach me a little bit of Irish live here on the on the group. Poggi McAvoyel says, Giriva Karja Gael, Tunonawa, O Glasgow Alba. Poddy is in Glasgow. Hello, Poddy. Desiree Riley is watching. Welcome along, Desiree. Mary DeFalco says, Hi, Anthony. Glad to be back. And of course, we are glad to have you back, Mary Falcha. Uh, Gina Zeller Boger is in Illinois. Welcome along, Gina. Gina. 
Vashonistas <laughs> is the term for Vashon Islanders. Yes, Vashonistas. I like that. <laughs> Henry Paddy Shearman is also in San Chach Anucht. Good evening, Tua. Good evening, Anthony. Trononoa, Henry. Maeve Fina Callahan says hello, Anthony and Tua. And hello right back to you. Mer Mary Burgess, watching from work in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Can't wait for part two. Good stuff. Excellent, Mary. Nice to have you along. Kimberly Fields Sipala says hello, Tua and Anthony. From another Washington, Ireland, Harstein. Very nice. We're all in it tonight. Fashion, passion, says Katrina. Demi Woe is in Colorado. Says it's a beautiful day there. Fantastic stuff. Send some of that weather over here, will you? Dawn Hilton says, hi, Anthony and everyone. Love from Lancashire. Graw more art. Uh, Dawn. Tom King says, good evening, Anthony, and my fellow Tua. Hope all in good fettle. In fine form so far, Tom. Connors at all, Tua. Because Connors at all, Cardia Galair, a Bolly Schlonia, a Glamnabonia. Louise Sherrill says, hello. Hi, Louise. Barb Jordan says, hello. Stormy day in Florida. There you go. Interesting weather around the place today. Rowan Grove said, just made 14 days in a row for Duolingo. Brilliant stuff, Rowan. That's fabulous. Bar Barbara Murphy, ha happy to join, as always, from sunny Tucson in Arizona. At least it's sunny somewhere in the world. Barbara, it's lovely to have you. A feminist is a good thing to be. Equality Abu, says Katrina. Brendan Long says, evening from Bally Garvin in Cork. Enjoying your stories. I'm glad you're enjoying them, Brendan. You're very welcome. Thought false, you wrote. Uh, da, 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 da. Maxine Adair Defty says good e evening from the north of Ireland, Anthony. Good evening to you, Maxine. Welcome along. Folge. Desiree says, I've missed you all. I'm watching with my two dogs and my friend Christopher from a hotel in Pueblo, Colorado after an 18-hour drive from Louisiana. Wow. You must be wrecked, Desiree. Hopefully you can stay awake for it. <laughs> Marijo uh, is watching. Hello, Marijo. I haven't seen you in a long time. It's a few years. I hope you are keeping well. Tarini Pendleton says, Banakti to all in Laguna Beach, California. Welcome, Tarini. Folge. Judy McQueen says it's rainy in Oregon, but she says hello nonetheless, Jiglich. Nikhlushim Shin Gominik. I don't hear that often. Okay, so I, I was saying listen. I don't listen to that often. <laughs> I don't hear that often. Uh, Veronica Casey says, hey, everyone. Jiglich, Veronica. Old fashioned. Shan Fashionta. Ah, have you now? Brilliant. Davo Gorin says, how he is from the Beaujolais in France. Bonsoir, mon ami Davog. Trenonawa. Okay, what are we on? <laughs> what substance are we on? Uh, no, I mean, what time are we on? We are on, I uh, would say, we call it 13 minutes. Erica Rivertree is saying hello from Louisville, Kentucky. Karen Gogus is on YouTube today. Folge, Karen. Good to see you also, Erica, as well. Sue Turner says hello all. Folge. Sue. Oh, we are into part two of Togal Brunia da Derga, the destruction of da Derga's hostel. And we were talking about red men and everything last night, weren't we? Uh, just before I go on, I should say, and I haven't done it in a while, thank you to all the patrons of Mythical Ireland over at patreon.com forward slash Mythical Ireland. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash mythical Ireland and perhaps you might consider becoming a patron and heading on over there and seeing what rewards you get for your patronage you can support mythical Ireland for as little as a dollar a month that's sure that's wouldn't even wouldn't even get you a, a scone never mind a coffee you know um but anyway I hope everybody is well and we're going to press on uh, so we did say that this is in four parts it's going to take four episodes to get through they won't be massively long episodes, but it's kind of too much to try and do in two or three episodes. That was the feeling anyway, and I hope you agree. I'm watching on my computer tonight, and I am totally looking at your books, Anthony. <laughs> yes, the the, uh, the follow-up, uh, the the next part of the library tour, We ha I mean, it's I can't remember how long it is since we did the first library tour, um, the first part. Um, to be honest, I was kind of waiting. There are more lights arriving, and there there may be other works in the in in the offing because I've run out of shelf space and I need to add more shelving. And I've had a little discussion with my other half, 
just just between us, just between us, Margaret. Don't tell anyone else. I might be adding more bookshelves shortly, but don't tell anyone. Strictly between us. I definitely don't tell my wife I told you that. <laughs> uh, library tour part one was episode 29. That's a long time ago. It was in April sometime. There you go. So on to part two. Ah, shut up. Let's call it 15 minutes, shall we? Let's call it 15. Right. Conora and his troops to Dublin. Doris O'Hara says, hello, Anthony and everyone. Missed today. It missed yesterday's live episode. Too late for work. Not to worry, Doris. Work comes first, even ahead of myths. Bethany Cutler says, I know I have several times as well. I was hoping he would part with some of them. An, au an auction, maybe. <laughs> uh, Patricia McAteer is waving. Good evening, Patricia Falcha. We've been enjoying your artworks. Melanie Corpy says, hi, Anthony. Jay Gooch, Melanie. Uh, okay, right. Conora and his troops to Dublin. Tis then the man of the black cropped hair with his one hand and one eye and one foot overtook them. Rough cropped hair upon him. They said that already. Though a sack full of wild apples were flung on his crown, not an apple would fall on the ground but each of them would stick on his hair. Though his snout were flung on a branch, they would remain together. Long and thick as an outer yoke was each of his two shins. Each of his buttocks was the size of a cheese on a withe. <laughs> a forked pole of iron, black pointed, was in his hand. A swine, black bristled, singed, was on his back, squealing continually and a woman big mouthed huge dark sorry hideous was behind him though her snout were flung on a branch the branch wouldn't support it her lower lip would reach her knee <laughs> he starts forward to meet conora and made him welcome welcome to thee o master conora Long hath thy coming hither been known. Uh, do you know what? I think I'll just read it in, in, in Stokes's English. I think it's just easier, isn't it? Who gives the welcome? Asks Conora. Fair Collier here with his black swine for thee to consume that thou be not fasting tonight. For tis thou art the best king that has come into the world. And we were saying last night, weren't we, or at least some of us, the non-vegetarians, the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the carnivores among us were saying, if you offered me uh, salted bacon or salted pork, uh, I'd be right there, no problem. <laughs> so we had a cheese butt. Excuse me, but I had to say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who said the moon was made out of cheese, huh? Get it? Moon? Never mind. Full moon? Never mind. Terrible. Jeez, wait till the women start writing that book about the men, says Katrina. <laughs> yeah. Oh, slim pickings there, huh? Anyway, what is thy wife's name, says Conora. Kichul, he answers. That's C-I-C-H-U-I-L. Kichul, he answers. Any other night, says Conora, that pleases you, I will come to you and leave us alone tonight. Nay, say the churl, for we will go to thee to the place wherein thou wilt be tonight, O fair little master Conora. And I wonder, you know, um, if if the if the uh, if the scribes of the Middle Ages could hear this, it is a terrible joke, Rowan. I completely agree. If the scribes of the Middle Ages could hear this, in uh, you know, late ninety uh, late. 19th century or early 20th century English. Uh, <laughs> sure, they would be slightly bemused. Tony Campbell is watching. Tony So he goes towards the house with his great big mouthed wife before him, sorry, behind him, and his swine, short bristled, black, singed, squealing continually on his back. 
That was one of Connera's taboos, and that plunder should be taken in uh, and that plunder should be taken in Ireland during his reign was another taboo of his. Now plunder was taken. Katrina, I'm ignoring you now, okay? <laughs> <laughs> now plunder was taken by the sons of Dundessa, and five hundred there were in the body of their marauders, besides what underlings were with them. This too was a taboo of Cunneras. There was a good warrior in the north country, weighing over withered sticks. This was his name. Sorry, I'm going to bring up the Facebook in case I need to paste in any links. Why he was so called was because he used to go over his opponent, even as a wain would go over withered sticks. Now plunder was taken by him, and there were 500 in the body of their marauders alone, besides underlings. There was after that a troop of still haughtier heroes, namely the seven sons of Ailil, and Maeve <laughs> behind him. <laughs> I, I'm going to have to turn off the comments. You guys are trying to distract me here. <laughs> behind him, yes. Behind his cheesy butt. I get it. The seven sons of Eileel and Maeve, each of whom was called Maine, M-A-N-E. And each Maine had a nickname, to wit, Maine Featherlike and Maine Motherlike. And Maine Gentle Pious, Maine Very Pious... Main unslow, would that not be just main quick? And main honey worded, main grasp them all, and main the loquacious, <laughs> talkative bloke, obviously. Ray Pine was wrought by them. As to main mother like and main unslow, there were 14 score in the body of their marauders. Main fa father like had 350. Main honey worded had 500. Main grasp them all had 700. Main the loquacious had 700. Each of the others had 500 in the body of his marauders. The rear guard. <laughs> this is John Roach. You're going to have to stop it. Really. We've moved on from the whole cheese butt thing. <laughs> there was a valiant trio of the men of Kualu of Leinster, namely the three red hounds of Kulu called Kehak and Klohak and Connell. Now, rapine was wrought by them, and 12 score were in the body of their marauders, and they had a troop of madmen. Yes, and we also, in two of the mythflicks, have a troop of madmen among us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mad funny men. In Connor's reign, a third of the men of Ireland were reavers. He was of sufficient strength and power to drive them out of the land of Aaron so as to transfer their marauding to the other side, in brackets, Great Britain. But after their transfer, they returned to their country. When they had reached the shoulder of the sea, they met Inkel, the one-eyed, and Ekel and Tulchine, three great-grandsons of Conmac of Britain, on the raging of the sea. A man ungentle, huge, fearful, uncouth was Ingel. A single eye in his head, as broad as an ox hide, as black as a chafer, with three pupils therein. 1,300 were in the body of his marauders. The marauders of the men of Aaron were more numerous than they. They go for a sea encounter on the main. Ye should not do this, says Inkel. Do not break the truth of men, fair play in brackets, upon us, for ye are more in number than I. Nought but a combat on equal terms shall befall thee, say the reavers of Aaron. <laughs> Tom King. <laughs> have, have you not got a, a forge to be attending to? <laughs> there, there is somewhat better for you, quoth Inkel. Let us make peace since ye have been cast out of the land of Aaron. And we have been cast out of the land of Alba and Britain. Nice the way he says Alba and Britain. 
Let us make an agreement between us. Come ye and wreak your rapine in my country, and I will go with you and wreak my rapine in your country. Uh, there's going to be a joke there. They follow this council and they gave pledges, therefore, from this side and from that. There are the sureties that were given to Inkel by the men of Aaron, namely Fergar and Gabor, or Fer Lee, and Fer Rogan, for the destruction that Inkel should choose to cause in Ireland, and for the destruction that the sons of Dundessa should choose in Alba and Britain. A lot was cast upon them to see with which of them they should go first. It fell that they should go with Inkel to his country. So they made for Britain, and there his father and mother and his seven brothers were slain, as we have said before. Thereafter they made for Alba, and there they wrought the destruction, and then they returned to Erin. And clearly here Alba in this story refers to Scotland. Tis then now that Conor, son of Etherskill, went towards the hostel along the road of Coolo. Tis then that the reavers came till they were in the sea off the coast of Bregia over against Hoth, or Bin Etter as it would have been called. Then said the reavers, strike the sails and make one band of you on the sea that ye may not be sighted from land. And let some light foot be found from among you to go on shore to see if we could save our honours with Inkel, a destruction for the destruction he has given us. Who will go on shore to listen? Let someone ago, that's what it says, let someone ago, says Inkel. Who should, keep in the composure, I'm trying desperately, who should have there the three gifts, namely, gift of hearing, gift of far sight, and gift of judgment. I, says Maine, honey worded, have the gift of hearing. And I, says Maine, unslow, have the gift of far sight and of judgment. Tis well for you to go thus, say the reavers. Good is that wise. They... Then nine men go on until they were on the hill of Hoth to know what they might hear and see. Be still a while, says Main honey worded. What is that? asks Main unslow. The sound of a good king's cavalcade I hear. By the gift of far sight I see, quoth his comrade. What seest thou here? I see there, quoth he, cavalcades splendid, lofty, beautiful, warlike, foreign, somewhat slender, weary, active, keen, whetted, vehement, a good course that shakes a great covering of land. They fare to many heights with wondrous waters and invers. Of course, invers are uh, inlets or mouths of rivers. Uh, estuaries, we might say. Unslow. This is a translation. I don't have the Irish. That's the one thing I don't like about this one. I'm going to have to get a version where the Irish and the English text are side by side. What are the waters and heights and invers that they traverse? Jim Conway is, says he's in very late. Fault you, Jim. Better late than never. You're welcome. Easy to say. Indion, Kult, Kulchen, Mafat, Amat, Irmafat, Finna, Gushte, Gushteen, Grey spears over chariots, Ivory hilted swords on thighs, Silvery shields above their elbows, half red and half white, garments of every colour about them. <laughs> Thereafter I see before them special cattle, specially keen, 
To wit, thrice fifty dark grey steeds, small headed are they, red nosed, pointed, broad hoofed, big nosed, red chested, fat, easily stopped, easily yoked, foray nimble, keen, whetted, vehement, with their thrice fifty bridles of red enamel upon them. I swear by what my tribe swears, says the man of the long sight. These are the cattle of some good lord. This is my judgment thereof. It is Conora, son of Etherskill, with multitudes of the men of Erin around him, who has travelled the road. Back then they go that they may tell it to the reavers. This, they say, is what we have heard and seen. Of this host then there was a multitude, both on this side and on that, namely thrice fifty boats with five thousand in them, and ten hundred in every thousand. Susan Scott says, in late too, but happy to be here. Erin's got in the way. That's perfectly all right. Uh, Susan, it's lovely to have you along. Fault you. Sorry. Thrice 50 boats with 5,000 in them and 10 hundred in every thousand. Wow. Then they hoisted the sails on the boats and steer them thence to shore till they landed on the strand of Fulpe. When the boats reached land, then was Makecht a striking fire in Dadurga's hostel. At the sound of the spark, the thrice 50 boats were hurled out so that they were on the shoulders of the sea. I think in the case of reavers, they're talking about ra raiders, aren't they? Um, like border raiders, I would have thought. Could be wrong. Not an expert in these matters. Be silent a while, said Inkel. Liken thou that, O Fur Rogan. I know not, answers Fur Rogan, unless it is Luchdun the satirist in Awanmacha, who makes this hand smiting when his food is taking, taken from him per force. Or the scream of Luchdun in Tower Lukra. Of the kecht's striking a spark when he kindles a fire before a king of Erin where he sleeps. Every spark and every shower which his fire would let fall on the floor would broil a hundred calves and two half pigs. May God not bring that man, even Conora, there tonight, say Don Dessa's sons. Sad that he is here under the hurt of foes. Me seems, says Inkel, it should be no sadder for me than the destruction I gave you. This were my feast that Cunnera should chance to come there. Their fleet is steered to land. The noise that the thrice fifty vessels made in running ashore shook Dadurga's hostel, so that no spear nor shield remained on rack therein. But the weapons uttered a cry and fell all on the floor of the house. Liken thou that, O Conora, says everyone. What is this noise? I know nothing like it, unless it be the earth that has broken, or the Leviathan that surrounds the globe and strikes with its tail to overturn the world, or the bark of the sons of Dundessa that has reached the shore. Alas, that it should not be they who are there. Beloved foster brothers of our own were they. Dear were the champions. We should not have feared them tonight. Then came Conora, so that he was on the green of the hostel. When Makecht heard the tumultuous noise, it seemed to him that warriors had attacked his people. Thereat he leapt onto his armour to help them. Vast as the thunder feet of three hundred did they deem his game in leaping to his weapons. Thereof there was no profit. 
Now in the bow of the ship wherein were Don Dessa's son was the champion great accoutred, wrathful, the lion hard and awful, Inkel the one-eyed, great grandson of Conmac. Wide as an ox hide was the single eye protruding from his forehead, with seven pupils therein, which were black as a chafer. Each of his knees as big as stripper's cauldron, each of his two fists was the size of a reaping basket, his buttocks as big as a cheese on a wide, each of his shins as long as an outer yoke. I am going to maintain my composure uh, despite uh, the heckling of the crowd. So after that, the thrice 50 boats and those five thousands with 10 hundred in every thousand landed on the strand of Furdthe. Then Conora with his people entered the hostel and each took his seat within, both taboo and non-taboo. And the three reds took their seats, and Fir Kalya with his swine took his seat. Thereafter, thereafter, Da Durga came to them with thrice fifty warriors, each of them having a long head of hair to the hollow of his poles, and a short cloak to their buttocks. Speckled green drawers they wore, and in their hands were thrice fifty great clubs of thorn with bands of iron. Welcome, O Master Conora, quoth he. Though the bulk of the men of Erin were to come with thee, they themselves would have a welcome. There must be... What, what phase is the moon tonight? <laughs> what the... Never mind, that's a full moon joke. I shouldn't have even mentioned it. <laughs> when... They were there, they saw a lone woman coming to the door of the hostel after sunset and seeking to be let in. As long as a weaver's beam was each of her two shins, and they were as dark as the back of a stag beetle. A greyish woolly mantle she wore. Her lower hair used to reach as far as her knee. Her lips were on one side of her head. She came and put one of her shoulders against the doorpost of the house, casting the evil eye on the king and the youths who surrounded him in the hostel. He himself addressed her from within. No, no sneezes yet, Todd. You're welcome. Well, O woman, says Conora, if thou art a wizard, what seest thou for us? Truly, I see for thee, she answers that neither fell nor flesh or thine shall escape from the place into which thou hast come, save what birds will bear away in their claws. It was not an evil omen we foreboded, O woman, saith he. It is not thou that always augurs for us. What is thy name, O woman? Calib, C-A-L-I-B, she answers. That is not much of a name, says Conora. Lo, many are my names besides. Which be they, asks Conora. He had to ask, didn't he? <laughs> is this like, you know, uh, uh, bar, bar stool uh, chat up lines? Easy to say, quoth she. Samon, S-A-M-O-N. Sinand, Sesklend, Sov, Kyle, Kol, Dichwem. Dichul, Dihim, Dichwimne, Dichruyne, Darne, Darne, Darune, Egam, Agam, Ehamne, Gnim, Kluche, Kehardam, Nith, Neman, Noinen, Bau, Blosch, Blosk, Blor, Hoi, E Ifa la Sro, Machte, Mache, Mede, Mod. I need a glass of wine. Uh, on one, <laughs> I need a slice of cheese. <laughs> on one foot and holding up one hand and breathing one breath, she sang all that to them from the door of the house. 
Yeah, Mary for short, says Neil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My name is Salmon Sin and Seklan Sob Kyle Call Dickum Dickul, but you can call me Mary. <laughs> <laughs> I swear by the gods whom I adore, says Conora, that I will call thee by none of these names, whether I shall be here a long or a short time. What thou what dost thou desire, says Conora? That which thou too desirest, she answered. Tis a taboo of mine, says Conora, to receive the company of one woman after sunset. Though it be a taboo, she replied, I will not go until my guesting come at once this very night. Tell her, says Conora, that an ox and a bacon pig shall be taken out to her and my leavings, provided that she stays tonight in some other place. If in sooth she says it has befallen the king not to have room in his house for the meal and bed of a solitary woman, they will be gotten apart from him from someone possessing generosity, if the hospitality of the prince in the hostel has departed. Savage is the answer, says Conora. Let her in, though it is a taboo of mine. Great loathing they felt after that from the woman's converse, and ill foreboding, but they knew not the cause thereof. The reavers afterwards landed and fared forth till they were at Lekka Kinschleve. Ever open was the hostel. Why it was called a bruin or a bruden, a bruin was because it resembles the lips of a man blowing a fire. Great was the fire which was kindled by Conora every night, to wit, a boar of the wood. Seven outlets it had. When a log was cut out of its side, every flame that used to come forth at each outlet was as big as a blaze of a burning oratory. There were 17 of Conora's chariots at every door of the house. Blackbird is back. And by those that were looking from the vessels, that great light was clearly seen through the wheels of the chariots. Not entirely sure if it's a blackbird. Canst thou say, O Fur Rogan, what that great light yonder resembles? I cannot liken it to aught, answers Fur Rogan, unless it be the fire of a king. May God not bring that man there tonight. Tis a pity to destroy him. What then deemest thou, says Inkel, of that man's reign in the land of Aaron? Good is his reign, replied Fair Rogan. Since he assumed the kingship, no cloud has veiled the sun for the space of a day from the middle of spring to the middle of autumn. And not a dewdrop fell from the glass till sorry, the grass till midday, and wind would not touch a beast's tail until nones. And in his reign, from year's end to year's end, no wolf has attacked aught save one bull calf of each buyer. And to maintain this rule, there are seven, seven wolves in hostage ship at the side wall of his house, and behind this, a further security, even Maclock, and tis he that pleads for them in Conora's house. Knowns, of course, is the afternoon prayers, isn't it? Afternoon, afternoon, the knowns of the after, of the... Uh, after midday. In Conora's reign are the three crowns on Erin, namely crown of corn ears and crown of flowers and crown of oak mast. In this reign too, each man deems the other's voice as melodious as the strings of lutes because of the excellence of the law and the peace and the goodwill prevailing throughout Erin. May God not bring that man there tonight. Tis sad to destroy him. Tis a branch through its blossom. 
Tis a swine that falls before mast. Tis an infant in age. Sad is the shortness of his life. This was my luck, says Inkel, that he should be there, and there should be one destruction for another. It were not more grievous to me than my father and my mother and my seven brothers, and the king of my country, whom I gave up to you before coming on the transfer of rapine. Tis true, tis true, say the evildoers who were along with the reavers. The reavers make a start from the strand of Ferdtha and bring a stone for each man to make a cairn. For this was the distinction which at first the Fians made between a destruction and a rout. A pillar stone they used to plant when there would be a rout. A cairn, however, they used to make when there would be a destruction. At this time then, they made a cairn, for it was a destruction. Far from the house was this, that they might not be heard or seen therefrom. For two causes they built their cairn, namely, first, since this was a custom in marauding, and secondly, that they might find out their losses at the hostel. Every one that would come safe from it would take his stone from the cairn. Thus the stones of those that were slain would be left and whence they would know their losses. That's fascinating, isn't it? And this is what men skilled in story recount, that for every stone in Carnleca, there was one of the reavers killed in the hostel. From that Cairn Lecca in Hui Kellig is so called. A boar of a fire is kindled by the sons of Dundessa to give warning to Cunnera. So that is the first warning beacon that has been made in Erin. And from it to this day, every warning beacon is kindled. This is what others recount that it was on the eve of Samhain the destruction of the hostel was wrought, and that from yonder beacon, the beacon of Samhain is followed from that to this, and stones are placed in the Samhain fire. That's also very interesting. Sorry, I'm taking a margin note in pencil here. Interesting. Then the reavers framed a council at the place where they had put the cairn. Well then, says Inkel to the guides, what is nearest to us here? Easy to say, the hostel of Hua Durga, chief hospitaller of Erin. Good men indeed, says Inkel, were likely to seek their fellows at that hostel tonight. This then was the council of the reavers, to send one of them to see how things were there. Who will go there to espy the house, say everyone? Who should go, says Inkel, but I, for tis I that am entitled to dues. Leyland Gaunt on YouTube says there's an interesting paper on the Dadurga by McCone. Uh, yes, I wonder is there a link to that? Uh, the the woodses in Monaster Boys say that these lads are mental. Did they ever do anything simple? <laughs> no, you know, it's all very, very convoluted, isn't it? What are we on? Home brew, says Austin Davies. Joey McD says, hello from sunny San Diego. Glad to hear it's sunny somewhere in the world because it's cloudy here today. I have the bird here beside me singing and... Uh, I'd nearly just stop reading and just let him do the singing for the rest of the evening. Inkel went to reconnaître. In other words, he went on reconnaissance. The hostel with each one of the seven pupils of the single eye which stood out of his forehead to fit his eye into the house in order to destroy the king and the youths who are around him therein. And Inkel saw them through the wheels of the chariots. 
Then Inkel was perceived from the house. He made a start from it after being perceived. He went till he reached the reavers in the stead wherein they were. Each circle of them was set around another to hear the tidings, the chiefs of the reavers being in the very centre of the circles. They were the Fergur and Fer sorry, they were Fergur and Fergel and Ferrogel and Ferrogan and Launa the buffoon and Inkel the one-eyed, six in the centre of the circles, and Ferrogan went to question Inkel. How is that, O oh, Inkel? asks Fer Rogan. For Ro Rogan, is it Rogan or Rogoin? There's no father, so it's Rogan. Ro Rogan. Rogan, Rogan. However it be, answered Inkel, royal is the custom, hostful is the tumult, kingly is the noise thereof. Whether a king be there or not, I will take the house for what I have a right to. Thence my turn of rapine cometh. Murdoch Mach Andrui says hello from New Albany in Indiana, right across the Ohio River from Louisville, Kentucky. Good evening, Murdoch. And on Jli Dermata says Giarive Golair, Giagrich and Folge. We have left it in thy hand, O Inkel, say Connor's foster brothers, but we should not wreak the destruction till we know who may be therein. Question, hast thou seen the house well, O Inkel? asks Fair Rogan. Mine eye cast a rapid glance around it, and I will accept it for my dues as it stands. Thou mayest well accept it, O Inkel, saith Fair Rogan. The foster father of all of, of us all is there, Aaron's over king. Conora, son of Etterskill. And Guido Bruce is watching. Good evening, Guido Falce. Question. What sawest thou in the champion's seat, high seat of the house, facing the king on the opposite side? The room of Cormac Condlungas. I saw there, says Inkel, a man of noble countenance, large, with a clear and sparkling eye. Guido says, sorry, I'm late. No problem, Guido. It's good to see you. Fault you. And even a set of teeth, a face narrow below, broad above, fair flaxen golden hair upon him, and a proper fillet around it. A brooch of silver in his mantle, and in his hand a gold-hilted sword, a shield with five golden circles upon it, a five-barbed javelin in his hand, a visage just, fair, ruddy he hath. He is also beardless. Modest-minded is that man. And uh, Paula Snow Queen says two half-pigs is a whole, but you see, it could be two... Uh, two, two Two haunches, it could be two rear ends of the pig, it could be two front ends, you know. A proper fillet around it. Yeah, I have no idea what that means, Katrina. F I L L E T. And after that, whom sawest thou there? The room of Cormac's nine comrades. There I saw three men to the west of Cormac, and three to the east of him, and three in front of the same man. Thou wouldst deem that the nine of them had one mother and one father. They are of the same age, equally goodly, equally beautiful, all alike. Thin rods of gold in their mantles, bent shields of bronze they bear, ribbed javelins above them, an ivory-hilted sword in the hand of each. An unique feat they have, to wit, each of them takes his sword's point between his two fingers, and they twirl the swords round their fingers, and the swords afterwards extend themselves by themselves. 
Liking thou that, oh, Fur Rogan, says Inkel. Easy, says Fur Rogan, for me to liken them. It is Conchobar's son, Cormac Conlungas, the best hero behind a shield in the man of Erin. Of modest mind is that boy. Evil is what he dreads tonight. He is a champion of valour for feats of arms. He is an, an hospitaller for householding. These are yon nine who surround him, the three Dungusses and the three Doylegusses and the three Dangusses, the nine comrades of Cormac Conglungas, son of Conchobar. They have never slain men on account of their misery, and they never spared them on account of their prosperity. Good is the hero who is among them, even Cormac Conlungas. I swear what my tribe swears. Nine times ten will fall by Cormac in his first onset, and nine times ten will fall by his people, besides a man for each of their weapons and a man for each of themselves. And Cormac will share prowess with any man before the hostel, and he will boast of victory over a king or crown prince or noble of the reavers, and he himself will chance to escape, though all his people be wounded. Woe to him who shall wreak this destruction, says Lomna Druth, even because of that one man, Cormac Conlungas, son of Conchobar. I swear what my tribe swears, says Lona, Lomna, or Launa, son of Dondessa. If I could fulfil my counsel, the destruction would not be attempted were it only because of that one man and because of the hero's beauty and goodness. Paul, Paul Garron says, Tome on Shaw and Ish, Falcha on Tua Galer. I'm here now. Greetings to the whole Tua family. Falcha. And Trinonawa Paul Kunasatar too. Uh, excellent. And uh, we have a couple of people conversing Oskelga on YouTube, which is brilliant. It is not feasible to prevent it, says Inkel. Clouds of weakness come to you. Nine times ten, yeah. It's a funny way. Clouds of weakness come to you. A keen. This is why I always like to have the Irish version of the text on the opposite page, which I don't have in this case. A keen ordeal will, which will endanger two cheeks of a goat, will be opposed by the oath of Fur Rogan, who will run. Thy voice, O Launa, says Inkel, hath taken breaking upon thee. Thou art a worthless warrior. I and I know thee. Clouds of weakness come to you. Neither old men nor historians shall declare that I quitted the destruction until I shall wreak it. Reproach not our honour, O Inkel, say Gur and Gabor and Ferrogan. The destruction shall be wrought unless the earth break under it, until all of us are slain thereby. Truly then, thou hast reason, O Inkel, says Launa Druth, son of Dundessa. Not to thee is the loss caused by the destruction. Thou wilt carry off the head of the king of a foreign country with thy slaughter of another, and thou and thy brothers will escape from the destruction, even Inkel and Ekel and the yearling of the rapine. Harder, however, it is for me, says Launa Druth. Woe is me before every one. Woe is me after everyone. Tis my head that will be first tossed about there tonight after an hour among the chariot shafts, where devilish foes will meet. It will be flung into the hostel thrice, and thrice will it be flung forth. Woe to him that comes. Woe to him with whom one goes. Woe to him to whom one goes. Wretches are they that go. Wretches are they to whom they go. There is nothing that will come to me, says Inkel, in place of my mother and my father and my seven brothers and the king of my district, whom ye destroyed with me. 
There is nothing that I shall not endure henceforward. Though a ellipsis, <laughs> three dots, there's obviously a, a word missing from the Irish text. Though a something should go through them, say Ger and Gabor and Fer Rogan, the destruction will be wrought by thee tonight. Woe to him who shall put them under the hands of foes, says Launa, and whom sawest thou afterwards. Behave yourselves. That's enough talking about goat's backsides. <laughs> this has been a funny episode. Yeah, you're obviously all like like the like the uh, the kids in the classroom when the regular teacher is out, you know, and the substitute teacher is in, and you're all having a little giggle. <laughs> I saw the room of the Picts. I saw another room there with a huge trio in it. Three brown big men, three round heads of hair on them, even equally long at nape and forehead. Three short black cowls about them and reaching to their elbows. Long hoods were on the cowls. Three black huge swords they had and three black shields they bore with three dark broad green javelins above them. Thick as the spit of a cauldron was the shaft of each. Liken thou that, O oh, Fur Rogan. <laughs> Nora, is that a confession? We are like three sheets in the wind. <laughs> Hard it is for me to find their like. I know not in Aaron that trio, unless it be yon trio of picked land, who went into exile from their country and are now in Conora's household. These are their names. Duvlongis, son of Trebuat, and Trebuat, son of Hua Lonshke, Lonshke and Kornok, son of Hua Fiach. Fiach, F A I C H, not F I A C H. Fiach. The three who are best in Pictland at taking arms are that trio. Nine decades will fall at their hands in their first encounter. I presume that's nine tens again. And a man will fall for each of their weapons, besides one for each of themselves. And they will share prowess with every hero in the hostel. They will boast a victory over a king or a chief of the reavers, and they will afterwards escape, though wounded. Woe to him who shall wreak the destruction, though it be only on account of those there. Says Launa Druth, I swear to God what my tribe swears. If my counsel were taken, the destruction would never be wrought. Ye cannot, says Inkel, clouds of weakness are coming to you. A keen ordeal which will endanger, etc., etc. And whom slowest thou there afterwards? The room of the pipers. There I beheld a room with nine men in it. Hair, fair and yellow was on them. They all are equally beautiful. Mantles speckled with colour they wore. And above them were nine bagpipes. Four turned, ornamented. Someone saying, oh no, not bagpipes, please. <laughs> if you play bagpipes in Dundurga's hostel, everybody will flee with their ears covered in every direction. Enough light in the palace were the ornament on these four tuned pipes. Liken thou them, O Fur Rogan. Easy for me to liken them, says Fur Rogan. He obviously has a thing for bagpipes. Those are the nine pipers that came to Conora out of the elf mound of Bregia, that is the she of Bregia, which is somewhere in the district of Meath and possibly at Brunabonia, because of noble tales about him. These are their names Bind, Rovind, Rirvind. Shiva, Diva, Dechrind, Omal, Komal, Kielglind. Wow. The, they are the best pipers in the world, so good that they nine have unpronounceable names. Nine Enneads will fall before them. E-N-N-E-A-D-S will fall before them. And a man for each of their weapons and a man for each of themselves. And each of them will boast a victory over a king or a chief of the reavers, and they will escape from the destruction, for a conflict with them will be a conflict with shadow. They will slay, but they will not be slain, 
for they are out of an elf mound. Woe to him who shall wreak the destruction, though it be only because of those nine. Ye cannot, says Inkel, clouds of weakness come to you, etc. And after that, whom sawest thou there? The room of Conora's majordomo, M-A-J-O-R-D-O-M-O. There I saw a room with one man in it, rough cropped hair upon him. Though a sack of crab apples should be flung on his head, not one of them would fall to the floor, but every apple would stick on his hair. His fleecy mantle was over him in the house. Every quarrel therein about seat or bed comes to his decision. Should a needle drop in the house, its fall would be heard when he speaks. Above him is a huge black tree, like a mill shaft, with its paddles and its cap and its spike. Liken thou him, O Fur Rogan. Easy for me is this. Tujla of Uli is he, the steward of Connor's household. Tis needful to hearken to the decision of that man the man that rules seat and bed and food for each. Tis his household staff that is above him. That man will fight with you. I swear what my tribe swears. The dead at the destruction slain by him will be more numerous than the living. Thrice his number will fall by him and he himself will fall there. Woe to him who shall wreak the destruction etc. <laughs> Ye cannot, says Inkel, clouds of weakness come to you. What sawest thou there after that? And thus concludes part two. Ceacht uh, a, a do of the destruction of Dardergus Hostel. The repetition, alliteration, lists, full names and family lines. These are all part of oral story traditions. They don't make sense now in print our style of writing, reading, and understanding stories is very different. Absolutely true, Maeve. Uh, and these are stories that were likely to have been told with great gusto and energy and perhaps sung, uh, or at least sort of half sung, you know. Oh, sorry. Didn't mean to do that. Any comments other than those about the, uh, the cheese and the... <laughs> Four cheese, three red men, two half pigs, one goat cheek. They all have credit cards. Uh, somebody wants to know what's the name of the band. Yeah, the Pied Pipers of Dodergas Hostel. I don't know. Oh, a few people are fond of the pipes. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to insult the uh, the bagpipe lovers of the world. And the birds are still singing outside. If there are any... I'm off to get cheese and crackers in a minute, says Veronica. I'm glad you all had a bit of fun tonight. You know, Anthony, on your creaking shelves, do you have early Irish myths and sagas translated by Geoffrey Gantz? I do indeed. Has a less arcane style and includes the destruction of Dardurga's hostel. Uh, let me have a look for a moment. Uh... Yeah. You like drones, Anthony. Yes. Ah, <laughs> drones. <laughs> the drone of the bagpipes. No, I don't. The destruction. Of, yeah, but it's probably. A, I wonder, is it a summarized version? Who was that that was asking me? Uh, Longti Men Menosi. Um, it's probably a much shortened version. Let, let's not jump to conclusions. Hmm. It is actually, it's, it seems to be equally long. Yeah, I wonder whether I could transfer from to, tomorrow and read the, the latter two uh, sections in um, from this rather than the 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 very archaic uh, uh, 
uh, Stokes version. Yeah, where was I about to begin? Part three of Stokes's version uh, begins with what does it begin with? It begins with the room of Macecht, Connor's battle soldier. Let's have a look for that. Yeah, Macect, here we go. Yeah, maybe I'll look at doing that. Yeah, thanks for that. I forgot about that. There you go. Can't hear the birds if it's playing. Any other questions? How can you not like the pipes that are calling from Glen to Glen, etc., etc., etc.? I actually like the uh, the Illin pipes. Michael Kenny is watching... Falsha Michael, Connasatatu. Great fun tonight. I'm glad you all had uh, fun. Craft work, says John. Fun it was indeed. So let's do it again tomorrow night. Yeah, that's it for the moment. Uh, part three tomorrow. Uh, and I will, I'll try and pick it up from that uh, perhaps less archaic version. And uh, thank you, uh, Long T, uh, for your help on that one. Um, that's uh, that's quite helpful because it, it is it's a little bit, isn't it? It's so archaic that it's nearly, you know, it needs to be it needs to be translated from the archaic in English into understandable modern English. So everybody, keep safe. Uh, make sure that you keep washing your hands, social distancing, especially if you're outside. Um, if you're outside. It's better to wear a face mask, according to most advice, uh, and especially if you're going into a crowded area like a supermarket or if you're going onto public transport like a bus or a train or anything like that. Just keep yourself safe and keep well and come back to us uh, uh, tomorrow and keep coming back to us as long as we continue with Live Irish Mits. In the meantime, I'm Anthony Murphy. Call us of sound sleep. Uh, good night, or uh, if it's... Uh, good afternoon, good morning, and all that. Uh, and we'll see you tomorrow, hopefully. Slán go fold. Bye for now. And to the YouTubers, we'll see you tomorrow. Slán go fold.